I shall be a servant of the Holy Quran as long as I am alive. I am the soil of the way of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Whoever extracts other words from these words of mine, I will be complaining about both the reporters and those words. The exalted Mevlana, the Sultan of the hearts, the spiritual soldier to whom the meaning of the Hadith, the Prophet's teachings, was revealed. Scholars are the successors of the prophets. He is the sun of reality who shines over mankind and whose light we are now more in need of than ever. The exalted Mevlana felt love as he wrote, It left nothing of myself in me. This understanding developed real freedom, which inspired waves of love-based teachings to mankind. The Mevlavi sect was established by Sultan Veled, the son of Mevlana, on the basis of decency and in accordance with teachings of the exalted Mevlana and the saying, the whole meaning of the Holy Quran comes down to decency. This sect has invited humanity to partake of goodness, truth, love, tolerance, and in short, good morality by following wise and mature sheikhs, heads of the dervish order for many centuries, and has established places, norms, and behavior perfectly. The name whirling dervishes would not be something familiar to most Turkish people. In Turkey, the followers of Jalal al-Din Rumi are called Mevlevis, and this is the Turkish pronunciation of the word Maulana, which means our master or our teacher in Arabic and Persian, because Rumi was considered to be their spiritual guide. So the followers of Rumi are known as the Mevlevi Dervishes. Dervish is another name for a Sufi. What is a Sufi? A Sufi is somebody who wants to have a direct experience of God or the ultimate reality. And Sufism has a very long and rich history within the Islamic tradition. Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi is a man who lived in the 13th century of the Common Era. But even though he lived many, many years ago, his life and his teachings are very relevant to those of us living in the 21st century. One aspect of his life that is so relevant is the fact that he moved around a lot, particularly as a young man. He and his family had to leave their hometown of Vakhsh in what is today Tajikistan in Central Asia and journey first westward to Baghdad and then south to the Arabian Peninsula to Mecca, finally winding up in Anatolia, in, in, in southwest Turkey, in a place called Konya, which would be Rumi's final home. He had the experience of being an emigre, of being someone who had to leave his home for reasons of social upheaval and political turmoil. Really, this was the, the eve of the Mongol invasions into Central Asia. 
and uh, the political and social situation uh, in his homeland was a very unstable one. He also had the experience of having to make a home in a very new and very different place, in a very different culture than that of his own. So he understood the, the tensions of feeling like an alien in a strange land and, and perhaps being even homesick uh, for that place that you were most familiar with. When Rumi and his family arrived in Konya in the early 1220s, his father, Bahaidin Valad, took a position as teacher at the main madrasa in Konya, which at the time was the capital of the Seljuk Empire. Rumi was eventually to succeed his father in this position, and when he did, earned the reputation of being one of the most renowned and knowledgeable scholars of Islam of his day. He taught law and theology in the madrasa of Konya, where his father taught. With Konya as the center, the Mevlevi sect has flourished, especially in Anatolia, the Balkans, Cyprus, the Arabian Peninsula, and North Africa. And many statesmen, scholars, and artists were among their members. The Mevlevi became the source of inspiration and incentive and the driving force in the creation of innumerable scientific inventions and works of art, completely representing the Islamic civilization. But the story is that one day Rumi was coming home from his classes with all his lecture notes and books and everything, you know, carrying all these things. And suddenly he was accosted by a wild, ecstatic Sufi who is known as Shams of Tabriz. And this Shams grabbed all of Rumi's books and notes and threw them into a nearby well. And Rumi was astounded and horrified and he said, my knowledge, my books, it's all been taken away, what shall I do? And Shams said to him, if your knowledge could be taken away so easily, then what good is it? And so Rumi had a sort of aha experience, and he decided to become a disciple of Shams, that this person had the real experiential knowledge. And so Shams became Rumi's spiritual teacher, and the two were inseparable for a long time. It's clear that that meeting changed the lives of both of these men. Rumi would never be the same, and neither would Shams. Each was looking for that person who could help the other be introduced more profoundly into the mysteries of God and the meaning of God's presence in human life. And then the story goes that later on, Shams disappeared, and there are various accounts of how that happened. And Rumi was utterly distraught at the loss of his beloved friend and teacher. But oddly enough, and this is really a key to understanding so much of Rumi's teachings about the relationship between God and the human being, oddly enough, it was in this separation from his beloved partner in spirit that Rumi began to learn most about what it means to love the other and particularly what it means to be consumed and taken up in the love for the ultimate beloved, the love for God. So he used to turn or whirl around a pillar in his Sufi lodge. And while he was doing this whirling, he found himself in a kind of altered state or trance and he was able to recite beautiful poetry and over time this poetry was recorded and written down and it forms the book known as the Masnavi and this is considered to be one of the greatest works uh, probably in any language but certainly in the Sufi tradition and it's in the Persian language. The theme of the intensity of love discovered in separation from the beloved is one that runs through most of the poetic corpus of Mevlana. But perhaps the best known passage that takes up this theme is the famous opening 
uh, to his epic poem, The Masnavi. Beshnav az ne chon hikayat mikonad, az jodai ha shikayat mikonad. Listen to the reed flute as it tells the story. Complains of the agony of separation. And the lines go on to talk about and and elaborate this this image of the flute, the reed for the flute being cut from the reed bed, and the plaintive song, the wailing, grieving sound of the reed flute, is really the essence of that flute, in its desire to return to its point of origin. And this is a basic kind of teaching about the human condition from the Sufi perspective, that we human beings are in a sense in exile, in loneliness, in pain, because, because we have been removed from our origin, our source, with God, with the divine. So while we're here in this world, in a certain way, it's painful. We, are, we have longing, we have a state of separation. But at the same time, like the reed flute, whose music is very mournful, but it's also very beautiful and very deep and very meaningful, human life can be a path of transcendence and spiritual progress along the way of returning to our source. So that opening lines of Rumi's um, poetic book encapsulate um, that sense of return, which is very central to his teaching and very central to the whole later Islamic mystical tradition. A few lines of poetry that have, through the centuries, been attributed to Jalaluddin Rumi and which in many ways do capture the spirit of Rumi's teachings about the importance of of our connectedness to others in life, particularly our connectedness to God and to our faith community, is uh, a cluster of lines that begins, Baz a, Baz a, Haran che hasti Baz a, come back, come back, whatever you may be, come back. Even if you are an unbeliever or an idol worshiper, come back. The Sufi lodge is not a lodge of hopelessness. Even if you have broken your repentance a hundred times, come back. This is a call to all of us who feel the brokenness of our relationships, the brokenness of our relationships to our family members, our loved ones, our friends, and particularly the brokenness of our relationship with God. I think this message of God's mercy and God's openness, God's call to us to, to return to those values and ideals which are at the center of what it means to be human beings is a message that I think is timeless and of course particularly important uh, for us today living in a world that's filled with strife, uh, filled with uh, cross-cultural misunderstanding and filled with fear. Another important theme in Rumi's poetry is the theme of transformation. I think human beings are, are naturally predisposed to stay where they are, to play it safe, to hold on to the pieces of their identity as it exists in the moment. And so much of the Sufi experience, so much of Rumi's own life experience was, a, was an experience of moving around, not only physically as he did in his, in his early days, leaving the land of his home in Central Asia and eventually making his way to Konya and Anatolia. It's not only about the physical journey, but it's also about the spiritual journey, the inner journey, which entails a great deal of change and transformation. The theme of the pain of transformation and the joy that comes with that pain is probably very powerfully expressed in these famous lines from Rumi, which run something like this, I died as a mineral and became a plant. 
I died as a plant and rose to animal. What should I fear? When have I ever become less from dying? Yet once more I shall die as a human being and soar with the angels, but I must even pass eventually from that angelic state because everything perishes except the face of God. In these lines of poetry, Rumi is challenging us not to be afraid of change and not to be afraid of growth. He's telling us it's a natural part of our human destiny. I think in some ways that means don't be afraid to expand your horizons. Don't be afraid to look at things from the perspective of the other. Sure, it may challenge your perspective. Sure, it may challenge your identity and who you think you should be. But it's only through such challenges and it's only through the growth that come from such challenges that we really become the women and men that God created us to be. The ceremony of the Mevlevi dervishes is clearly something that is quite complex and that has come together over a long period. You know, we, ima we may imagine uh, Rumi whirling or turning around a pillar um, in his Sufi lodge. Well, first of all, why did he do that? And um, one explanation is that probably most of us remember that as children, we liked to whirl around. You know, children often will go outside or, and just turn around spontaneously sometimes until they become so dizzy that they fall over and there's some kind of longing or delight in doing that which may be a replication of the experience of first coming into consciousness if you will so this turning of the dervishes is a kind of wanting to go to the place you were before you were born returning to the source and uh, the ceremony itself is quite choreographed and the music is very complex. It's really Ottoman court music. So there are, shall we say, a lot of cultural elements that mix with the spontaneity uh, or the sort of trying to achieve an altered state of consciousness element of the Mevlevi ceremony. Over time, all of the elements of the ceremony acquired a significance. The sama, or the whirling of the dervishes, is filled with symbolism of, of transformation. When they first come out to, to begin the ceremony, the dervishes are, are dressed in dark woolen cloaks and, and cylindrical headgear. The cloaks symbolize the earth of the grave and the headgear, the hats, symbolize the, the tombstone. But uh, no sooner do we encounter the dervishes in their state, reminding us that, you know, we're all bound for the grave eventually, we realize that the grave can't really contain what human beings are ultimately meant to be. The dervishes shed their dark woolen cloak and beneath we see them in their white burial shroud. But even this shroud of purity can't contain human destiny. As the dervishes begin to whirl, begin to open themselves up to God and the ultimate transformation of life eternal that God can grant to us, the skirt expands, their arms expand, and ideally the very heart of the dervish expands to the presence of God. And in fact, one of the main Mevlevi uh, ceremonies is performed every year on the death anniversary of Rumi, which is understood as a symbolic mystical marriage or a union with the Divine Beloved. So it's actually a happy time. And again, the, the, the shrouds, shall we say, or the gravestones are actually um, positive symbols. There's a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, die before you die. And of course, this is a basic 
mystical teaching, that one has to transcend the limited uh, ego that helps us get through our everyday life and uh, expand the consciousness to something higher. So in that sense, uh, a mystical death or an opportunity for spiritual transformation. So that's part of the significance of the ceremony. the people turning have practiced it for many years, often since childhood in the city of Konya. The uh, young dervishes uh, join together and learn how to do the turning itself. And some of the elements of turning, I mean, if somebody watches it for the first time, they might wonder, why don't they get dizzy and fall over like kids do? And part of the technique is similar to what dancers do, what's called spotting although I believe dancers do it externally, you know, to sort of think of a spot outside on the wall. The dervishes find their internal point of focus and stay on that as they are turning so that they don't become distracted or dizzy because of the world that's turning around um, outside them. Islamic mysticism itself uh, tends to be quite a controversial issue nowadays. Uh, there are some Muslims who say that, you know, what many Sufis do, what the Mevlavi Sufis do in the Sama, for instance, is not part of the practice of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And insofar as the Prophet didn't do that, then as Muslims we shouldn't do that. Other Muslims argue, though, that the example of the Prophet Muhammad perhaps goes deeper than what we find in the recordings of the sayings and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad. The medieval Sufi masters were certainly very pious Muslims who were dedicated and devoted to the lived example of the Prophet Muhammad. But their understanding of this example wasn't restricted solely to the hadith reports, that, that voluminous and very rich genre of Islamic literature that talks about uh, the sayings and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad. The Sufi masters believed that the interior life of the Prophet, uh, that the deeply spiritual practices of the Prophet uh, were perhaps uh, too profound, too esoteric to be recorded in the Hadith literature and therefore uh, were passed on orally from the Prophet to some of his close companions who then passed it on to uh, the, the generation of the followers and on to, on to subsequent generations down through the centuries. So uh, Rumi was someone who understood himself to be, and he was certainly understood to be, uh, a pious Sunni Muslim, devoted to the Sharia, devoted to Islamic law, devoted to the Sunnah, the lived example of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, but he obviously thought that uh, his Sufi praxis was a way of simply taking his devotion to the Sunnah, to the example of the Prophet, to another level. The Quran at one point says, "If Allah dhikran kathiran," mention God frequently, uh, and 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 many Muslims understood the ideal way to live one's life is to keep God on one's mind and in one's heart almost constantly. Islamic law calls all Muslims to do that by praying five times a day. This is the first and most important form of recollecting God, of keeping God in one's mind and in one's heart. For the Sufis, something like the Sama of the Mevlavis um, is an extension of that response to the command of God to to keep God always on one's mind and in one's heart as a human being. Though 
Some Muslims may disagree with him for Rumi and some of the other great Sufi masters of his day and of our own day. There is no tension, there is no conflict between trying to pursue one's spiritual journey, uh, trying to have that closer walk with God that all Sufis strive to have, and to being a good Muslim, to being a kind, the kind of Muslim who observes all the commandments and prohibitions of the law that God sets down in the Qur'an and also in the lived example of his prophet and messenger Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Rumi's message is a universal one that transcends the 13th century in which he lives and transcends the environment of the Middle East or Konya or Turkey um, in which he lived his life. And that message is one of love, love uh, beyond borders, beyond uh, restrictions. As he says in one of his poems, I'm neither of the East nor of the West. I'm neither of fire or of water, nor of air, nor of earth. What he's saying is that nothing about my identity or about this human condition is so essential that it should keep me from reaching out to others. Really the norm is universal love and transcending the restrictions not only of my own ego but of my own culture, of my own belief system. So this could be a kind of program or um, uh, inspiration to interfaith dialogue, to cooperation across cultures, across religions that, um, that you know the real bottom line is our shared humanity but that that humanity itself is a beautiful thing that does not have to be limited by a particular identity of nation, name, um, gender, and so on. Uh, love is the transcendent principle that unites us all. I think Rumi would say that any interfaith dialogue would be incomplete if it didn't result in bringing about some change in the people who were involved in that dialogue. Change and transformation is a very important theme in Rumi's poetry. It's, it's part of what we have to undergo to be who we are. And in particular, it's part of how we discover who God is. There's a famous verse in the Qur'an which uh, translates something roughly to this effect. Um, o humanity, we, that is God, created you from a male and female and we appointed you into tribes and nations so that you may come to know one another. Surely the most noble of you in God's sight is the most God-conscious and God is all-knowing and all-aware. This verse from the Qur'an suggests something that I think Rumi knew very deeply. And that is, we can only come to know God most fully by understanding the way others encounter God. Those others can be members of our own family, uh, people of our own faith community, but those others can also be, and must also be, people from outside of our communities, from outside of our cultures, even from outside of our faith traditions. This Quranic theme is a theme that runs very deeply through Rumi, and I think it's a theme that resonates very much with modern people. The Mevlevi teachers bearers of real love and special friends of secret love bring to pass an excellent revolution in the hearts of their followers with their deep looks, causing a fountain of phase, prosperity, and almost changing the soil to gold. The Mevlevi, who have only fakir, meaning poverty towards Allah, 
and need no one else but him, become scornful of the world and make do with less, are concerned with their cleanliness and integrity, and especially with their spiritual growth and maturity and intellectual tactfulness, and have their social lives affected deeply. A dervish is a person who purifies himself from the love of the world, hypocrisy, worldliness, falsehood, and lust, which are symbolized by the Arabic letters Dal, Ra, Vav, Ye, and Shin. Here, this dervish is Samazen, the whirling dervish, starts the Sama, ritual movement as if he was reaching for reality and giving thanks for what he gets from Allah.